All right, it's one o'clock here in Boston and time to get started. Hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A webcast. My name is Dave McCormick, VP of Product Management here at Alpha Software, and I'm pleased to present Dion McCormick, no relation, who is our lead solutions engineer. Uh, today, Dion has a presentation for you, which should last about 20 minutes, but then he is here to answer your questions. Also on the line, we have Sarah Mitchell, who's in charge of our documentation here at Alpha, who's gonna be doing research in the background. So any questions that you may have, go ahead and type them into the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel. Today's session is being recorded and a copy of today's recording and others um, will be at uh, our YouTube channel as well as videos.alphasoftware.com. If you do go to the YouTube channel, we do in fact have a playlist dedicated just to these Q&A webinars, which might make them a little bit easier to find. So let's get started. Dan, I'm gonna take you off mute here. And hello, Dion, are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. Let me go ahead and make you the presenter. Well, thank you, everybody, for thank joining you, us. Dave. Thank you, Dave. Coming through okay? Coming through. Excellent, excellent, excellent. As Dave mentioned, we're here in, uh, for you, so what's important for us are questions. And in fact, today's was a follow-on question from our presentation last week I got via email. So we always appreciate any kind of, uh, you know, suggestions for topics and questions ahead of time. And you can always send those to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S, at alphasoftware.com. And we uh, use those to guide us as we do what we need to do in the webinar. Uh, so today we're going to follow up a little bit on some stuff we touched upon last week, which was using the control bar and building sort of web desktop web interfaces. So we'll kind of recap that real quickly, and then we'll go into sort of an extended discussion about a specific part of that there. Well, but with that in mind, first I wanted to say thank you to everybody for taking time out of your schedule. I know we're in a summer schedule this time of year, and it's always very intriguing and interesting because it kind of changes things around. Uh, actually, I'm excited. I'll be at the Boston. We'll be doing this webinar next week from Boston directly, so that should be a lot of entertainment there. We have a lot of new products, new capabilities that are coming out, so the whole team's getting together to work on um, how effectively to roll that out to our extended developer community. We're very excited about everything going on. There are so many changes. Very, very exciting. So that said, I want to remind you also that, uh, as Dave said, we uh, post these each work or each week to the video library. So we have both a video library, but also we have the YouTube channel so that sometimes I find YouTube's a little easier to find some things along those lines, as David mentioned. So we'll do that there. And also, as uh, again, Sarah is doing an amazing job of continuing to enhance the documentation site. We'll be talking about that a little bit more today. And in fact, we'll probably have some good links for some of the topics I go over today uh, available for you from there. But I also wanted to let you know that we have registration open for DevCon 2018. We talk about that a lot, but I'll tell you, it's incredible the kind of information you walk away from there, uh, both in terms of information from Alpha, but also relationships and uh, information from other uh, developers that you can build relationships with. We're very, very excited about this. It's in coming up October. It's amazing. We're already in mid June and going very quickly. So uh, it's going to be October before you know it. Uh, luckily, that's football season. So we're excited about that. So with that, I want to go ahead and dive into our presentation today. Uh, oh, and remember, uh, there is Transform Tuesdays. So if you're interested in learning more about the Transform product, uh, my esteemed colleague here, uh, Dave, runs a weekly webinar on Tuesdays. I don't think we had one this week. But mostly weekly. We did not mostly. do one last yeah. week. And for those of you who were signed up for it and then did not get a notice that it was canceled, I apologize. I'm going to send those out by hand next time rather than using the GoToWebinar system. Yeah, so bad I, I day. I a few people going, hey, where where is it, man? I'm, I'm I know. Sure not here. So sorry about that. You know, and, and we really do appreciate you spending time with us. And, and it's really gratifying. I actually had a client who was saying, hey, what happened to the transform? Obviously, they're more interested in transform than me. But that's another issue. I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> so damn you, Dave. Uh, oops, we're going to delete that out. Um, 
But what's interesting is that they they were talking about it was actually a developer manager and he's just saying his team really, you know, enjoys these kind of presentations, gets a lot out of it. And so I'm encouraging, get us those topics, you know, and you tell us how we can help you. And that can be either questions or topics, whatever it is. So email those in. Uh, we obviously are executing on some of the key things we want to deliver uh, in terms to of sorry to interrupt, but to oh, email yes. them to email them to guides, G U I D E S at alpha software dot com and we will we will get them there. For, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the email address, it's guides at alphasoftware.com. We should, we should create a dedicated slide that just says that. I'll, I'm going to do idea. that so we can right, have excellent. that in the future, yes. um, the way to go there. Uh, but uh, we are going to be shifting gears as we go through the summer months. Um, we're going to focus more and more on all the new API capabilities, uh, specifically around the connections into Salesforce. Uh, and again, huge opportunity for any of our developers because we now have a very easy way for you to build web and mobile front ends on salesforce.com solutions. And also very exciting is just the ability to consume any type of web service and more importantly, as to publish as a web service. So that's going to be a continuing focus for the balance of the year because it really transforms alpha from a sort of think of it, we really traditionally were a front end for a database. I mean, the core of most applications were databases, but the world is moving towards web services, meaning that uh, instead of direct connection into databases or direct connection into um, application servers and things like that, it's really connecting services together through web APIs. And that's really where the industry going. And we want to make sure our developers have the number one tools to be able to do that. And we'll be enhancing on that the discussion around Transform because Transform in and of itself is a web API enabled alpha development environment. And there's so many cool things going on there in terms of what you can do. And what we're gonna see as we move forward is that Transform obviously has incredible capabilities in and of itself, but through the web API, through the integrations, you can now kind of take uh, peanut butter and chocolate, i.e. Alpha Anywhere and Transform, and intermix the capabilities together to create something just incredibly powerful. And so we'll be talking more about ways you can do that. We've shown a little bit of that, but we're going to dive into that um, in more detail from there. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to where I'm going to jump here and jump down. So uh, what we talked about last week, and I'm going to go ahead and go into my development environment first, is we talked about how you can use the uh, certain key components to generate a sort of essentially a tabbed UI equivalent or a desktop web uh, dashboard environment where you kind of have a header, and in that header you have maybe your profile buttons, your links here, and then you have menu systems, and then within here you can have different subcomponents and other pieces there within there. Oops, grid not fine. Oh, I moved it from one to another. That's the same. So it allows you to build these very powerful systems. And traditionally, we've used the tabbed UI, and, and uh, tabbed UI is awesome. I, I really enjoy using it, but I'm also starting to see more and more that because of the new control bar, the menus, et cetera, you can actually achieve a lot of what you do with the tabbed UI, uh, but actually add a lot more flexibility and simplicity into your system. So in my discussions last week, we talked about how you could take the following components, the panel cards, panel navigators, layouts, the control bar, and the menus to develop these essentially very powerful user interfaces for a desktop web. Uh, thus, not necessarily using the tab UI, you can use that, but also rolling your own. But also the other thing is through these, you get, and we talked a bit about it, you get a lot more flexibility in terms of styling and how you want laid out and the structure of the pieces and how they work together. So we went through that. And again, that's been posted and online there. But what we were talking about before, and we kind of hit it at the very end, was the idea of uh, the, using the control bar in a very powerful way. And the powerful way that we came up with was that control bars have things called disclosure. So let me do go back and we wanted to dive into that a little bit more today. So, you know, the control bar is that is used for that very valuable space at the top and bottom of your either mobile or desktop web solution. And in there you can have a series of icons and other things, but they also have this really powerful built-in function called disclosures. And think of disclosures as kind of pop-up content that you can add your dis your control bar to be able to do it. In fact, I did a discussion on this a while back and I'm gonna run down to my control bar section. 
Um, there are we, uh, disclosures, okay, yes. So there's this concept of disclosures and the idea behind the control bar disclosure is that, you know, you have a series of buttons either at the top or bottom of your screen. And when you click on one of those buttons, you wanna be able to show sort of pop-up content. So the initial use of pre-built disclosures were things like, I want to show like a waiting message to the user. And it kind of was driven from the mobile standpoint, uh, from the mobile world. But obviously, you can use control bars both on mobile and desktop web. So it started out sort of like, hey, you know, when someone clicks on something, there may be like a sync operation or a Ajax callback. You want to tell the person, hey, there's some... Uh, I'm I'm waiting for some content, so hold on, hold your horses, wait, and I'll get that done there. The other is maybe you want to ask some simple questions like, "Hey, here's a, a notification. Like uh, I clicked on a button, it said it did the search, and then I want to notify the person that it's been completed." Or I want to kind of ask them a simple question, saying, "Hey, do you really want to do this kind of scenario?" So disclosures were a way to pop up. You'll kind of see it's hard to see, but below that is the actual control bar. It pops up that message. Well, we started playing with it and the development team got into it and they said, hey, you know what? We can now do very powerful things where we can actually have custom disclosures where when you click a button, you could actually bring up almost a whole form. And you can actually see this, an example of this is here. And it's hard to see, but basically you have a button right here and then it slid down this content area and then that content area has a set of more buttons that are associated with it. So instead of taking up all this real estate, you can kind of start creating it. So this could either be a pop-up that shows, for instance, some other buttons, some other commands, or it could be like a pop-up with a, a series of questions, like almost like a little panel uh, or a form that can pop up to allow them to adjust it there. Now, I'm going to show you how we build those. And there was actually an original way that was done through HTML content. That was the original there. And then recently, uh, we've added an easier kind of way to do it. And I want to show you both methods so you kind of know what there are, because there may be different reasons you want to do them. Uh, but I also want to show you definitely this injectable content, because it really makes it very, very easy to add powerful disclosures to your pop-ups. So let's go back into my development environment here. And I want to show you where, did I create that? Yeah, okay, let's see, did I have that there? Okay, so what I have right now is I have a control bar up top, and I have some buttons right here, and then I have a menu on the left and my content right here. And what I would like to do is I'd like to add a button to my control bar that pops up just a little control panel or just like a little form. Like maybe it's like change my profile information or some kind of little level of form. So I'm gonna use, instead of creating another UX and putting it all here, I'm gonna create and use a built-in disclosure in my control bar to do that. So I'm gonna go into my design. I'm gonna go into my control bar section right here. And you'll see that I have basically items, which are all the different items that are on my control bar. Then I have a control bar layout here that shows how those items are put together. So like you'll notice over here, my cool dashboard in there. So the first thing I'm going to do is I wanna start with the end in mind. I'm gonna create a disclosure first. So I'm gonna go ahead and click disclosures here. And you'll notice we don't have any current disclosures in here. So I'm gonna add a new disclosure. And I'm gonna call it just disclosure one. It could be any name you want to right there. Okay, now it's called disclosure one and you'll see that I have two types of disclosure. One is HTML, the other is injectable. And we're gonna start with HTML. So what HTML is, is I can actually literally go in there and put some HTML in here. Uh, hello, webinar. Oh, I'm having a keyboard issue today. It's a <laughs> webinar. Sticky keys. Uh, yeah, the way, what's the temperature down there in Austin today? I, apparently, uh, that's uh, probably it. It's uh, in the mid 90s, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's not that pleasant there. Okay, <laughs> so you'll see right here. I can um, I can have this little text right here. So I'll click OK. I'm just going to make this very simple. That I'm all I'm doing is putting in. So I could define my form and everything right here, and I'll show you a little bit more. We can do that. So I've created a disclosure here. Now what I want to do is per my thing, I want to have a button that will open that disclosure. So I'm going to go over here to items. I'm gonna add a new control bar item. 
and I'm going to call this uh, uh, disclosure. Closure button one. And you'll notice there's a special type of button in here built called disclosure button. And I'm going to go here to disclosure button one. And I'm going to tell it, okay, for this button, when the person clicks on this button, I would like the disclosure to show my new disclosure, disclosure number one. And I'd like to explain it and tell it where to show it. So I'm going to use this fly out as an example here. And we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. So I created my disclosure. So think of that as my little sub panel or my little form. And in this case, it just has a little piece of HTML. And then what I wanted to do was I, I created a button that will open that up. Now I've got my button, but I need to actually show it on the control bar itself. So I'm gonna go back here to my layout and you'll see I've got a button here. So I'm gonna add that in my new disclosure button and I'm gonna make that the first one. And you'll notice now that I have my new button here. And in fact, let's go ahead and go back here and go to this disclosure button and let's make that a, uh, I'll say disclosure one. And so when we actually see it on the layout, it's got a little text right there. So I'll click okay. Okay, so I've added my disclosure, I've added a button to show it and put it on there. So now you'll see right here, I have disclosure number one and watch when I click on it, you'll see, hey, check that out. Below this, it showed my HTML. <clears throat> so this is a very simple version where all I'm doing there. So that could be like a message or it could be uh, whatever you want it to be. So let's do a couple things. Let's go ahead and modify that disclosure to make it a little more interesting. So I'm gonna go back into my control bar. I'm gonna go into my disclosure here and I'm gonna go into my HTML and I've got my uh, standard HTML here, but I'm gonna go ahead and insert a sample disclosure HTML. And this is just a sample. So as you can see, in here I have some HTML, I have some styling, I have some input fields and things like that. So already it looks a little confusing it is and hence why we added some new capabilities. But I wanna show you this first. So you'll see you have these controls and other pieces here. So now in my disclosure, instead of just a simple piece of HTML, I have a full form in HTML and you're welcome to build your own forms in HTML and do it. So now I'll open this disclosure and you'll say, oh, notice there's a field and field here with an OK cancel button, et cetera. So in that case, now I have basically a disclosure that shows an HTML form and that works really good. Now, uh, the one thing about that though, is that as you can see, you kind of have to be a little bit of an HTML person to really figure this out. There's, you know, you're putting in uh, div labels and other things like that. That's a little hard. I, I tend to like things a little simpler, to be honest. And for the first version, this is what it would happen, but now they came up with a great new capabilities here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna add a new disclosure. I'm gonna call that disclosure number two. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my items here. I'm gonna add a new disclosure button. So I'm gonna call it disclosure, uh, disclosure button two. Okay, and I'm gonna tell it that the disclosure I wanna open up is that disclosure number two. So again, and then I'm gonna to go to my layout and I'm gonna go, oh wait, I'm gonna go back to my button here and I'm gonna make this button look cool. I'm gonna say it's a uh, disclosure. Okay, then I'll go back here. Oops, I go to my layout and now I add it to my layout where I've got, I'm gonna add my disclosure button number two. Okay. So I've got on here, my button disclosure number two. Where'd that go? Huh, wonder why I did that. Oh, you know what I did? I added the wrong one, excuse me. Bear with me in here. I don't want disclosure button number one. I want disclosure button two. So bear with me, I go in here. So I've got now my new button disclosure number two. When I click there, that would show my second disclosure. Now, here's the cool thing we're gonna do is that when I develop that disclosure here, you notice there were two types. Disclosure is HTML or injectable container. Now injectable container has been around for a while. So let me go ahead and show you how that works. So I'm gonna go ahead 
and I'm going to go in here back to my UX. And I'm just going to go down here on panel card number four or wherever I want to put it. And I'm going to add a container in there. And that container is called injectable content. And as we've talked about before, what containers are are invisible control are invisible controls that are built into your UX. They don't aren't seen by anything, but they have very cool powers associated with it. So I'm going to click injectable content. You'll notice now there's kind of like an opening and closing tag, and it's in a different color here. And in here, I'm going to go ahead and build my form using the traditional method um, item one. Oh, jeez. I am really sorry about this, everybody. There's just something going on here. I think it has to do with that. Uh, have to reboot. It. It's well, it's parallel. Sometimes it kind of goes a little crazy. Sometimes, so. Oh, it's lost your keyboard. Yeah, I know. So item one. In the meantime, there we're getting some great uh, questions. So please keep sending in those. Oh, questions. good. Yeah. I'm going to do item two and item three. So I've got my three, like I'm basically building an, a UX form. And in there, I can then also have, for instance, a button, say, you know, do this. Okay. And I'll add in here a little image. I'm going to put that up top so it's kind of interesting looking. And I'll go in and select the image name. I think I have a built-in one. Uh, nope, I'll just create and create an image using an SVG icon, something really cool. Okay, and I'll put in some static text requirement. Okay, so you know this is traditionally how you set up and do this form, and everything here works the same. But I've got this thing called injectable number one. It's an injectable comment. So now I'm going to go back into my control bar. I'm going to go to my disclosure here. I'm going to go to disclosure number two, and now instead of HTML, I'm gonna say use an injectable container and use injectable number one. And I'm gonna go back to my button here, and I'm gonna make that a flyout one here, okay? So now watch what happens. I go into my working preview. I've got my first one, remember this, this was defined with HTML. Now I'll look at disclosure number two. Did I not do that right? Wait, what happened there? Live demo. Let's see. Make sure I uh, disclosure. No oh, uh, disclosure number two, injectable container items. Disclosure button number two. Disclosure number number two. And let's just grab another one here. Should I do something? Let's see. Okay. Oh, there. Wait. There it is. Okay. It is coming up, but I just need to adjust how it's working there. So let's go back to disclosure number there. Let's go fly out element. I think that's going to be the one I want. And that's where a little trial and error to get it used to it there. What is going on? Maybe I need my injectable content up here it should be anywhere in any panel card oh you know what it's got to be inside this panel navigator i put it inside this so let me go ahead and move this real quick i think that's what's going on there it has to be in there so let's see because it has i i forget what it is i've got this panel navigator and that's where the header is so i believe that's what was causing the problem no not yet it's showing the disclosure here Maybe I've done it wrong. Let's see. There's my disclosure. Um, ooh, uh, well, let me go into my second one I built. <laughs> I'll go, it's my structure here. The backup plan. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Bear, there, uh, where I have a button here and it shows right here. So um, let me go ahead and adjust that real quick. I'll, I've, I've got a backup. I've already, I'm learning slowly but surely here. Uh, control ballot layout, go right here. Layout number one, we'll edit that. Um, edit that one, and I'll add my button. Okay. And this will show you what it goes there. And then I'll continue here. Um, so I've got my button, you'll notice it comes right here. Okay, so 
Again, the idea is I've got injectable content. I can put anything I want in here. So for instance, I can go in here and put anything like a list, a view box, image, anything I want. It, it's just a UX construct that we've done before. In my control bar, I have a disclosure and that disclosure is pointing at that injectable content. Then I have a button here that says show that disclosure and then on my layout, I actually add that button here to that layout. Now, the cool thing about this, and this is where it's really powerful, instead of the HTML method where if I needed to change how this worked, I can just go over here and say, you know what, I'm gonna call that button. I'm gonna add the text in that button to be um, submit. I'm gonna make that a image followed by text. I'm gonna add the image name to be another image here let's say it's uh something like this just for giggles i'm going to add a new field in here because i want to add a new field that's going to be three okay and you know what let's put this all in a frame here and let's make this a frame and i'm going to say this settings okay now notice that this is none of this is shown the injectable content is not actually shown <coughs> Now, there's my settings. See, I've put in my bounding box, I've got my new field, I've got my submit button here, and I didn't have to go through all the figuring out HTML, I just created essentially like a little UX kind of thing. And another nice thing is that all of these fields and stuff like that, the button, like if I click on it, I can add action JavaScript, do whatever I wanna do, and it handles it. So what the control bar is basically doing is saying, hey, when you click that, I'm going to show this content for you. And now I can just manage that content there. So that's a really powerful. So again, we started out originally when we created the original control bar, the development team, when they created disclosures, used this HTML method, which turned out to be a little complicated and it kind of, you know, it worked, but it was like a little bit more work to put this together. And then they had the brainstorm and the idea is that, hey, why do that? Why not just use an injectable content, which is a, something that's been done and used for some time now and do that from there. Now I wanna show one other thing. You'll notice now that when I click on this button, it kind of pops down here. Now, how did I tell it how I wanted it pop down? Well, if you go back to your control bar, go to your disclosure, you'll um, go to the button here, you'll notice that the display type is set right here and there's a whole bunch of different display types. And what display types say is basically where and how am I going to show that content, that disclosure that you would like. So I'll show you another example of one is outside after. And I don't know if that changes it very much, but let's go ahead and let's do screen top. Let's make it directly different. And you'll see when I click here, it actually talks about, well, how does this work here? It's kind of like, so these are all different ways to display that disclosure. So let's go ahead and go into that disclosure here. Click that. You'll notice that it did it up here as top. And I'll go way back in here. We'll go ahead and change this from screen top to screen bottom. Let's go ahead and show this here. And you'll notice it popped up from the bottom. Could be kind of useful in certain situations. And then we can also go in here and say, let's do a cover. And you go here and, oh, it's kind of doing it. It's actually inside the control bar itself. So that's kind of, there's some, a whole series of one that will actually show it not in the content area, but actually within the control bar itself, uh, if you're making a little larger control bar. So you can kind of play with the different ones here. Now, the other aspect about it is that when you set the disclose, this delay type, you have, uh, aspects to say, for instance, how do I want to do the sizing of it? What are the, my margins? Do I want to animate it? Do I want to have auto hide? Which what auto hide means is that if they click outside of the disclosure, it's going to automatically hide that. You may not want that. You may want it that they have to click a button to do something in there. You can also add your own class name to actually structure like the background, the other pieces from there. So it allows you to do all these things. So if I select a different type of disclosure here, let's say I do cover, 
uh, that one's pretty the same, but let's say uh, screen left. Um, eh, most of them are kind of the same here. Oh, well, I guess most of them are pretty much the same, I guess. So, uh, let's go ahead and do screen left and we'll try that. You can adjust all these people here, including duration. Like, let's get rid of animation. Okay. So, let's go ahead and take a look at this. And I'm going to click on that disclosure. And you notice that there's no, it just boom shows. And you can adjust those pieces that are associated from there. So it allows you to adjust sort of exactly how you want this to disclosure. But the cool thing is once you've set that up to actually maintain the content of that disclosure, you just do it within this area here and there. Now, one really powerful thing about this is that since these are just other controls on my UX, and I can use all of the very powerful, uh, you know, show height expression, can calculated field expressions. I can create buttons on here that talk about the different things. So it really makes it easy to create very powerful sort of single uh, page interfaces for your your uh, your web. And I'll have to find out. And I apologize. I'm not sure why this. And I might have a hint. Maybe Sarah has an idea of what I'm doing wrong here. But when I click this here. You'll notice it's actually opening it up here instead of right here, and I'm not sure why not. You'll notice the HTML one here. It must be something I'm doing on here that's incorrect, so I'll have to figure that out and let you know what that is. But this shows you the example where you have a control bar in your header. You have an injectable content somewhere on this same UX. So for instance, it could be in another panel card, and this other panel card right here could never be shown to the user. So this could be my content there. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's say this panel card right here, I'm gonna make it, um, where is it, dockable, uh, docked. So I've made that docked and then in here I can put in some content that's actually my other real key content. And so you'll notice now that I've got my one panel card here, but then when I click here, it pops out and opens that. And so we'll go back actually into this control bar here. Let's go to there. Let's set that back to fly out element. That's a good one. And so you'll see that I actually have two panel cards. I have my primary one, but I have another one that's called doc. So it's hidden from the user. And then my actual um, injectable content is on that hidden one. So they never have to see this content from there and you can adjust everything. So like there's, I notice here, there's this little settings right here is like a little bit there. So I think if I go in here, go to the margin top, give it like 10 pixels. I think that will fix where, let's see if that works. Now notice I put a little fit there. So it looks a little better on that screen. You have a lot of fine tuned control over that in the system of terms. And what the disclosure is, if you think about it, it's like a hidden content area that is displaying that injectable content in here. So I can you know, change exactly how that works in terms of the background, location, padding, margining, all those kind of things there. And the beauty is that it makes for a very clean interface because you can add these disclosures that pop up that content information whenever you need to use it. Uh, in my previous one, just to let you know, is that uh, you could also use a similar method. Is it this one? Where is it? Yeah, that's disclosures. Uh, I think it's button button one that does that. No, I did. Ah, uh, there it is. You could also use the dockable panel, but we're not going to go through that. I really wanted to focus just purely on this disclosure capability. So with that, it's time for questions. I hope that's been clear in terms of how you have uh, disclosure information. You can do it one of two ways, either through HTML or you can do it through injectable content. Obviously, injectable is a lot easier. Uh, you can then control where it shows in terms of how it shows up on it, but you can create these really cool interfaces uh, using the control bar uh, disclosure concept within Alpha Anywhere. So with that, I'll go ahead and give it back to Dave for any kind of questions. Excellent. Boy, do we have questions. <laughs> we do have questions. Uh, so let's um, let's start. We have a bunch of control bar questions. Why don't we start there? Um, first of all, the uh, one question is about the injectable content, and you've placed it inside a panel card, but when you first load it, it's, um, well, two things. I'll get to the second thing, um, but first, it's supposed to be invisible when you when, when it loads, and it's only called when you 
when you invoke that disclosure. The question is, if it's invisible, does it does it have to be in that panel card? Can it be some other place in the UX? Yes, it can be anywhere you want it in the UX. So I could actually okay. just put it right in here, and it doesn't matter because injectable content is hidden okay. until it's used in a different place from there. So. so now this might be similar to Windows. There's a container type called a window, which uh, it's my understanding that it uh, also hangs out at and is is not displayed until it's summoned. Uh, using uh, JavaScript. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Now, so, the injectable yeah, okay, content is a little different animal. And the reason injectable is that okay. uh, there's another reason you can use injectable content that's pretty good. So let's go ahead and just do this right here. Okay, so you notice injectable content is empty, but I can show it right here. So that's kind of like that window. And that's a really good observation by the person is that, you know, well, why don't I just set up and use a window instead of that? Well, one thing is that the control bar has a lot of things you can dynamically show and hide these buttons. But there's another thing you can do with injectable content. And let's see if I do that correct. I'm going to put freeform layout in here. And then I'm going to go into my layout here. And I, I can insert dynamically injectable content in other areas of it. So I'm not just limited to using it in a disclosure. Injectable content can actually be used to insert it inside other things. So it's like this hidden control with some content in it that can be used to insert in other locations. So uh, there's some other use cases for using injectable, but right now we're using it with the control bar. So good observation, because it is very similar to what we're doing with the window concept. Terrific. Uh, also, what was noticed was when you go into working preview for a split second, it seemed to flash the injectable content on the screen before it disappeared. Oh, it just did it. Yeah, I'll see. Um, so, that. so, so maybe, two questions is, does that happen in live? Will that happen live or is it just a working preview weird thing? It's a working preview weird it's thing. It's a working preview weird thing. Okay, yeah. it doesn't happen live. All right, that's good. Excellent. Yeah. That, that answers that question. So as you know, it's right here. It didn't show up here. Nope. Let me do that one more time just to see. Actually, you know what? Let's do this. For people new, you can click uh, up here in your UX. You can actually launch inside right, right your Chrome, in, yep. your Chrome browser. Uh, I did show there. Hmm. Mm. I'll have to find out about that. That's a good observation. I'll, I'll, uh, it so should be invisible. So what, might, what you might be able to do is if you had another panel card that you never call, you could probably put the injectable content yeah, you know there. What? I'm going to change this to. I'm going to change this to. Yeah. Watch this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to panels. I'm going to make it a panel navigator. Uh -huh. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, to get rid of my panel layout. And then I'm going to take my injectable content and put it on panel card number two, because by default, only panel card number one is going to be shown. Right. So now that should be good. Oh, oh it did it to us it. again. Ah, <laughs> I wonder, maybe it's my version. I'm working on a little different. I've got a pre-release version. That just happened. Yep, it's showing it. So we'll have to investigate that and find that out. This sure should you. be this should yeah. be in both. It could right. be something about the control bars getting it set up or something like that. So we'll find out why that's, that's happening. It's report. not the behavior we expect, so we will go to no, and make it and make it the behavior that we expect in the future. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We'll report that. Thanks very much. Whoever pointed that out was very on the ball. Thanks very much. Sharp eyes. Uh, another question is uh, let me see if I can find the other one. It's related to this. Oh. Um, for the uh, fly, actually two flyout questions. One is someone said, "Hey, you just mentioned the term flyout. What, what does the term flyout mean? What's the?" It's just oh, good term point for them. Okay, so flyout flies out uh, the disclosure relative to the island. So think of it as kind of like um, swooping in, kind of thing. And this is it's a behavior similar to a menu. It flies out from the edge of the control bar. Um, so let's go ahead and look at that real quick. Go in there. So watch the edge of this control bar. It po you notice how it flies out to the bottom edge right there. And I've turned off animation in this situation. If I turn animation back on, let's see, then you'll see that the animation is a flying out from the top down. 
And so that's the concept of fly out. And there's different variants of it. And this is where you just kind of use a little trial and error is that we have fly out. This is relative to the element that was clicked. So you'll notice actually, if I do this cropping and you know, there, you see it's relative to my button right there. In fact, let's test this. Let's go into my control bar. Put I'm gonna go into my something. layout. Yeah. I'm gonna edit this layout and I'm gonna take this disclosure two here and I'm gonna add it over here. Okay, so now, instead of it being over here, it's over here. Now I click there, notice where the control bar, or the, uh, the uh, disclosure, it's relative to where the button is. So that's kind of nice. That's like a drop down menu kind of philosophy or uh, behavior that we've seen before. Uh, now I can go back to here and I can say, okay, fly out element cover, uh, but it's gonna cover the element that was clicked. And this is important for, for instance, like when you're on mobile, because you actually don't wanna take up too much screen real estate. So you'll notice now when I click button, it's actually, and it doesn't really show very well here, but instead of being below here, it's actually covering where I clicked on the item there. And so that it, it, that's much more effective when we look at a mobile platform than a desktop web. Uh, but that's the fly out. But you'll notice there's a bunch of other ones. Extend, it extends the disclosure from the clo bar. Uh, I'm sorry, from the control bar. So let's try that one. So we'll do that. We'll extend it. So it's very similar to fly out, but notice it's kind of extending it. It almost looks the same to me. <laughs> I don't know. There's some subtle difference there that is the difference between that one. But let me go back in here and extend. We'll go extend element uh element over so fly out and extend are kind of similar but i think they look a little bit differently now let me show you expand expand is kind of interesting let me go ahead and do expand after now the expand ones are a little different animal because watch what happens it actually you don't even see it because it's actually happening inside the control bar so let's go to this control bar here and i'm going to make this control bar let's say 100 pixels tall so I'm extending this control bar so it's a little bit larger in terms of that item there. Now you'll notice that, oh, check it out. The actual, when you do an expand, it actually appears in the control bar itself, not in the content below it. And there may be situations where you only wanna show, you, you don't wanna actually cover the, your content, you wanna basically show temporarily over your control bar this content, like maybe a menu or something like that, that will cover your control bar. But again, this is all about, there's some great uh, documentation in our documentation system. If you go in here, it actually tells you exactly what that behavior will be and what it does. And you can like play with that and see how it works from there. The other thing to realize too, is that you'll notice that, uh, let's go ahead and go into my working preview here. And I think I've reset it properly. Let's do a couple things here. Let's go into this and get rid of that height. Then I'm going to go back in here and adjust my disclosure to to be a flyout element. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to go to this frame here. And I'm going to go to the frame. Uh, um, I'm going to go actually, I'm sorry, go here to my control bar. So let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. So you'll notice that when I click here, I'm seeing what's below here. So the reason why is that a disclosure by its nature is a invisible kind of panel, because here's the deal. You may wanna show what's below that. If you're on a mobile platform, you may wanna have kind of like see the background bleed in so they aren't confused. They see this thing pop down, but they say, oh, look, something slid over my other thing. But you can take control of this by basically saying um, the cover, uh, Let's go ahead and do this real quick. Let me go ahead and adjust that. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's see. I'm kind of, I'm flying blind here. So let's go ahead and uh, in this, I'm going to add a new one here and I'll call it uh, background. And let's go ahead. So I'll call this dot background. I think that's how it is. And I'll go in the design and I'm going to say the background color is going to be, uh, let's make it, uh, I could make it an image, which is kind of cool. You could actually put an image below there, but let me go background color and I'll just make it, um, 
white. Okay. So now I have this thing called background. So I'll add that class and I've done it right. But what happens is when it generates this disclosure, it's gonna use that background. So let's see if it now, if I did it correctly. No, I'll have to play with that. Maybe that's a cover. Let's try this. Let's go. And again, this is, I'm kind of off my, um, uh, we'll probably come back and talk about it later. You're running off script, huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I decided like, you know, so, let's try that. Let's see what happens here. I thought I could do it on the fly, but I can't. I need a little more training. Yeah, it's still showing as empty here, but you can set all this. So you could set like a cool background image, you know, all the other pieces there. And you do that through basically CSS with the disclosure here. So we can go here and um, let's try the disclosure name here. Let's actually. could be how I defined it. Well, we'll go back to the questions. I don't want to waste any time, but you have a lot of control over making it look really sharp by doing the CSS. Right. And the... That was actually one of the questions was, uh, it looks like it's clear. Is there a way to set the background? So that a property of the, con of the control part disclosure. Yeah. And it looks no, like it is. Can, maybe maybe the CSS may not have been set up pro properly, but that's, that's where you go when you find it. So uh, we have actually two questions that came out of here is the disclosure injectable content. Why is it showing up? And the second mm -hmm. side of that is like how to make the background solid. So we'll do a little research just... in that. Wonderful. Nothing like doing these things live. All right. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, Flyouts. I'm trying to see if there's anything else control bar related before we move on to our other questions. Let's move on to our other questions. Okay. Great, um, great questions. questions. Um, here is a quick question. Is the latest release of Alpha able to connect to MySQL 8.11.0, which is the latest general release? And the answer is it should be. Uh, mm -hmm. If you run into any issue, we could we could certainly take a look. Um, but if there are any issues, we will be very happy to update our driver to make sure that it does work with MySQL. It is one of the native uh, drivers that we that we've actually created to work with Alpha. Um, and if you're finding that it is not working, um, you know, for any reasons, just send an email over to guides at alphasoftware.com. We have a person whose job it is to make sure that all of these connectors here are working perfectly and are keeping up with the latest versions. So if you run into an issue, uh, let us know. As far as we know, there is no issue with the current general release of that. Excellent. Um, and, uh, and you'll notice we support both MySQL and MySQL v4. Uh, there's two little, I think v4 added some new features and things like that. So, um, but yes, let us know. Great. So I have got two questions. One has to do with maps and one has to do with one to many relationships in a list and doing a search. And maybe we will start with a one to many relationship, uh, the search. And this one actually has got a visual that goes along with it. Oh, so cool. I'm going to share my screen if I could just to keep it interesting. Yeah. Hey, mix it up. And they've just, oh, I will. Yeah. So this person was nice enough to send us a screenshot and they have blanked out the data that you're not supposed to see. So as you'll see here, very heavily react, redacted. It looks like an FBI document about the Yeah, Roswell. exactly. Hey, are, are you part of the Mueller probe or is that, is this part of <laughs> That might be, and I can't tell you any of the Here are anyway, all the people so under here's, indictment. Here's what they're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> they have, um, okay, so they've got three lists here. They have a parent list, which is up at the top, and they have two child lists. It looks like they're called limits and ARRP. And they want to do a search. And if they find what they're looking for in either one of these child tables below, they want the corresponding parent record to appear above. And so far it's doing it. But if you take a look at that ID here in the top one, you'll see that for every child record, they're having a duplicate mm. of the parent. Ah, I see. So it's not, it's not doing a one to many. It's basically showing every matching that's probably just an internal just behavioral thing yeah okay 
So yes, okay, I see. So so the question I guess is can it be can we filter that list so that it was just down to the ID and perhaps we need to research that one. Yeah, I think that's going to have to be development because sort of I think the way that Alpha's built-in search functionality works for the list control, mm -hmm. it's going to return, if it finds it in a child record, it's going to return a parent record. So in this case, um, any and all, but it's interesting. It seems like it's duplicating that parent record for every right. match in the For each of the children, right, right exactly. Yeah, versus you know just what? returning the one. I'm going to send that question along to development. I've got the email of the person who sent it in. And uh, let's see if we can find an answer for that, because I, I have a suspect that could be used in other cases as well. So yes, indeed, uh, we will take a look at it. Nice looking interface, Great. by the way. It's a tabbed UI Isn't I'm looking at. Nice? And nice little yeah. icons for those buttons. That is very slick. That I was really the first like thing that. I saw. I thought that was really, really nicely done. Yeah, yeah, and thank you very much still using the tabbed UI metaphor yeah. up top and all that. So excellent. Yeah, awesome. And I also right, like I mean, on the right hand side, the little plus, uh, the three icons on the right hand side next to each uh, list. Oh, yeah. That is very, very nice. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Very nicely designed. Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much for sending that in and letting us share it. We appreciate that. And we will go and find the answer for you. Let me go ahead and make you presenter again. And we'll move on to the next question. This one has to do with maps and. Maps. You would call it geofencing, not the kind that where they track your cell phone, but right. the, where you're doing uh, more where you're looking within a range of uh, areas. So uh, some are just sort of general questions here, but let me find the exact question. And the exact question is they have a map and on the map they're placing markers based on longitude and latitude. So but now they also have another set of longitude and latitude fields, uh, which they calculate, and they want to do a search that's in an area that's defined by these markers. Is that something Alpha can do? And if so, can we do it? Is it disconnected or is it connected? I app? assume connected. I would assume okay. it's a connected application. So, so it brings way, up a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, and that's really critical because the, the way I would approach that is that um, the cool thing about uh, modern databases they have spatial um, pre-built spatial capabilities so you can do what are called spatial queries so the way i'd pro probably do that is do it as an x basic callback and in that x basic so let's try this here uh my sql spatial query okay so what you can do is and again this is uh um um you can and i'll try and find Oh, there it is right here. Okay. Um, so basically that's defining a polygon on the screen. So, okay. So you're bad. So let's take a couple of things. So first your, your first set of, of, of like locations or whatever they are like places. So you have them all there. Each one has a latitude and longitude that's associated with it. Now in uh, there, there is a, type of uh, when you build your database you can also create what's called uh, a geospatial field it's called point for mysql geographic for sql server and things like that but basically you're installing in that column the combination of the latitude and the longitude as a point and that's a known geographic kind of thing there so you, you, one thing that's if you've got your first table that has all your places in it and it's got lat lawn you're going to have to add another column that is a geography field that is probably a point field here. Because then what's great about that is there are built-in queries that say select uh, in a sphere, like for instance, in a circle there. So for instance, in this case, I give it a, Latin, uh, a, I give it a latitude and longitude point, so on there, and this query in the database will return all the records that match that. And you can also do that with polygons here. So it's a little bit of work in terms of understanding it. So what I would do is you can basically, so in your first list, you have all of your potential locations. The second one, you're gonna have maybe four points and those points define a polygon. Well, what you do with those four points is you, um, then you take those four points and you build a query out of it, send it to the database, say, hey, query my original table with 
these four points using the built-in geographic theory. And then that's gonna give you back a list of fields with their latitude and longitudes. Then those can be used to then update your map on your device that would then show just those locations that fit within that polygon. So in that case, uh, that's uh, t that would be number one. You could use the database itself to do that. Now, that said, option number two is our friends at Google Map Find in Polygon, okay? Now, option number two is you can, um, let's see, you can use Google Maps API and that potentially could give you the same result, but I'm a little less, I'm a little fuzzier on how you can do that. So in Google Maps, you can define these things called polygons, and I think you can search uh, within polygons to find contents within there. And in fact, built into alpha is in the grid component is pre-built functionality that does that. It's really cool. We can actually do geographic searches within it, and you can literally draw on a map. And uh, it actually, Sarah, if you're online, there's actually a great video of that uh, on, I think it was the V11 added that capability where in a grid, you could show a map and then in the search area, you can do that. So, I mean, I would kind of do things against the database because then you get a lot of really other cool, powerful things because you can enhance that by submitting other like pieces of data. So for instance, let's say I have locations and I have um, their latitude and longitude, I have their point location, but I also have some other data, like what kind of location is there. Then I could build up that query and say, okay, here's my polygon, find all the locations in here. And by the way, find all the locations that are ice cream shops or taco shops or whatever it happens to be. And then I can dynamically update my map. Now, the important thing to realize is that is a connected aspect, meaning that you're gonna do things connected there. And so you're going to need to be connected because you're going to do an X basic callback back to the database, have the database do the heavy work of locating the items within that polygon, but then it returns that data as lat and launch, and you can just then refresh your map to show that on the map, you know, show those specific locations on the map. So I would kind of lean towards doing this, but if that's not going to do it, you can uh, use the... Uh, JavaScript map API from Google developers that allows you to do things like that. Uh, let's see, what does it say? It draws a red circle. It, you know, this is putting there um, outside of a specific. So like for instance, you'll see in here, this is actually every time I click on here, it's seeing, uh, it's using the API to say, is it inside or outside the Bermuda Triangle? And so, there are built-in functions into there that you could do be doing JavaScript queries and um, and and say, okay, write, like look at, uh, you know, create that uh, polygon and then feed it one after another, or it probably has where you can do bulk and then give you just those items. But I tend to like the database because it does a lot of the heavy lifting, plus you have all that other data available. So I hope that gives you some pointers on how to go from there. We've got some new mapping functionality built into it. For instance, we can do map routing and stuff like that now, uh, which is built into it. So we may see this kind of functionality come down the road because we just keep enhancing it as well. our users come up with these use cases. But I would approach it uh, using the database first, and then if that's not gonna do it, uh, then I might look at then using the JavaScript map I, uh, API. But do realize that if you do a ton of calls, there are certain limitations that Google Maps API, whereas if you're making an X basic call back to your database, you can do that as much as you want and you're not gonna get charged after a certain period of time. So it depends on your use case, but those are the ways I would approach that from within the system. Excellent, and in the meantime, Sarah has done research for us. Our documentation Yay. person has, our chief here has posted uh, UX Action JavaScript to Google Maps. Uh, where we have Alpha software documentation on that, and also uh, the, the notion of using alternate views in a grid, if you're working within a grid, which is a, also a good way of working with that. So those two links are in the chat window if you want to grab those. Um, let's see what else we've got. We've also, she also posted the link to the control bar documentation, which is worth checking out because there's there's quite a lot of it. Hey, you know what uh, you could do is you could make that, um, you could create a list 
and then the yeah. and then you know have that list use an X basic callback to basically load itself with the content of those items, and then you can then just point the list to the map to use the client side data to update the map. So there's some really cool ways you can approach this. Um, instead of just yeah. a direct X basic callback, you could maybe create a list, and that list actually is the what calls back to the server and says, okay, run a query which you've passed at the arguments, and then it brings back a list of locations within that area, and then you could use like you know the built-in client side mapping functionality to say, okay, now update this map by just pointing it at this list, and I'm done. So it could save you a lot of time and energy. Thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate that. Fantastic. Uh, for the questions that we did not get to, please send an email to guides at alphasoftware.com. Otherwise, we have fortunately have run to the end of our time. Dan, Great thanks questions. very much for presenting as always. And thank you everyone who attended, especially those of you who asked questions and, and helped keep this conversation going and keep other people helping to learn. So we hope to see you next Wednesday. We're also doing a Transform Tuesday. If you're interested in that, send an email to guides.